Chapter 16 The Written Works The entire writings of Sri Bhagavan are very small in bulk, and even of them, nearly all were written to meet the specific needs of devotees. Devaraja Mudlaye records in his diary how Sri Bhagavan remarked on this when speaking about a visiting poet. All this is only activity of the mind. The more you exercise the mind, and the more success you have in composing verses, the less peace you have. What use is it to acquire such accomplishments if you don't acquire peace? But if you tell such people this is, doesn't appeal to them, they can't keep quiet. They must be composing songs. Somehow it never occurred to me to write a book or compose poems. All the poems I have made were on the request of someone or other in connection with some particular event. Even forty verses on reality, of which so many commentaries and translations now exist, was not planned as a book, but consists of verses composed at different times and afterwards arranged as a book by Varun Ganar and others. The only poems that came to me spontaneously and compelled me, as it were, to write them without anyone urging me to do so, are the eleven stanzas to Sri Aranachala and the eight stanzas to Sri Aranachala. The opening words of the eleven stanzas came to me one morning, and even though I tried to suppress them, saying, What have I to do with these words? They would not be suppressed, until I composed a song bringing them in. And all the words flowed easily, without any effort. In the same way, the second stanza was made the next day, and the succeeding ones the following days, one each day. Only the tenth and eleventh were composed the same day. Bhagavan went on to describe in his characteristically vivid way how he composed the eight stanzas. The next day I started out to go round the hill. Balani Swami was walking behind me, and after we had gone some time, Ajasami seems to have called him back and given him a pencil and paper, saying, For some days now, Swami has been composing poems every day, he may do so today as well, so you had better take this paper and pencil with you. I learnt about this only when I noticed that Palani Swami was not with me for a while, but caught me up later. That day, before I got to Virupaksha, I wrote six of the eight stanzas. Either that evening or the next day, Narayan Rede came. He was at the time living in Valor as an agent of Singer and Company, and he used to come from time to time. Ajasami and Palani told him about the poems, and he said, Give them to me at once, and I will go and get them printed. He had already published some books. When he insisted on taking the poems, I told him he could do so, and could publish the first eleven as one form of poem, and the rest, which were in a different meter, as another. To make up the required quota, I at once composed two more stanzas, and he took all the nineteen stanzas with him to get them published. Many poets compose songs to Sri Bhagavan in various languages, outstanding among them being Ganapati Sastri in Sanskrit, and Marunganar in Tamil. Although in the conversation quoted above, Sri Bhagavan deprecated the writing of poetry as a dissipation of energy that could be turned inwards to satna. He listened graciously and showed interest when poems were sung before him, though. 
Prose books and articles about him were also written, and he would often have them read out and translated so that all could understand. One was struck by the extraordinary impersonality of his interest, the childlike innocence of it. There are two prose books which one might say were written by Sri Bhagavan. During the early years of Virupaksha, when he was still maintaining silence, he wrote out instructions on various occasions for Gambaram Sashaye, and after Sashaye's death, these were arranged and published as a book under the title Self-Inquiry. Similarly, his replies given at the same period to Shiva Praksam Pillai were amplified and arranged in book form as Who Am I? The other prose books from the ashram have been published and were not written by him, but are records of verbal expositions that he gave in answer to questions and are therefore all in the form of dialogue. Bhagavan's poems fall into two groups, those which express rather the approach through bhakti, that is through love and devotion, and those which are more doctrinal. The first group is composed of the five hymns to Sri Arunachala, all written during the Virapaksha cave period. The element of devotion in them does not imply any abandonment of Advaita, but is perfectly fused with knowledge or yana. They were written from the standpoint of the aspirant or devotee, even though he who wrote them was in fact established in the supreme knowledge, in the bliss of union not the pain of longing. And it is for this reason that they appeal so powerfully to the heart of the devotee. Mention has already been made of two of them, the eight stanzas and the eleven stanzas. In the eleven stanzas, Sri Bhagavan not only wrote as an aspirant, but actually used the words, one who has not attained the supreme knowledge. Desiring an explicit confirmation, one of the devotees, a Mr. Bose, asked him why he wrote so, whether it was from the standpoint of the devotees and for their sake, and Sri Bhagavan admitted that it was so. The last of the five hymns, Sri Bhagavan wrote first in Sanskrit and then translated into Tamil. The story of its writing is astounding. Ganapati Sastri asked him to write a Sanskrit poem. And he replied, laughing, that he did not know the fundamentals of Sanskrit grammar or any Sanskrit meters. Sastri explained a meter to him and implored him to try. The same evening he created five perfect verses in Sanskrit. They have been rendered into English as follows. Ocean of nectar, full of grace, engulfing the universe in thy splendor. O Arunachala, the Supreme, be thou the sun and open the lotus of my heart in bliss. O Arunachala, in thee the picture of the universe is formed, abides and is dissolved. In this enigma rests the miracle of truth. Thou art the inner self who dances in the hearts as I. Heart is thy name, O Lord. He who turns inward with untroubled mind to search where the consciousness of I arises, realizes the self and rests in thee, O Aranatala, just as a river when it merges in the ocean. Abandoning the outer world with mind and breath control in order to meditate on thee within. The yogi sees thy light, O Arunachala, and finds his delight in thee. He who dedicates his mind to thee and seeing thee always beholds the universe as thy form, who at all times glorifies thee and loves thee as none other than the self, Atman, 
He is the master without peer. Being one with thee, O Arunachala, and lost in thy bliss. These stanzas are more doctrinal than the other four hymns, epitomizing as they do the three main margas or approaches to realization. Speaking about them later, Sri Bhagavan explained, the third stanza deals with the sat aspect, being, the fourth with chit, consciousness, and the fifth with ananda, bliss. The yani becomes one with the sat, or reality of being, like a river merging in the ocean. The yogi sees the light of chit, or consciousness, while the bhakta, or karma yogi, is immersed in the flood of ananda, bliss. However, the most moving and beloved of the five hymns is the marital garland of 108 verses to Sri Arunachala, commonly known in English by its refrain, Arunachala Shiva. During the early years of Sri Bhagavan's abode at Virapaksha, Palani Swami and others used to go into town to beg food for a small group of devotees, and one day they asked Sri Bhagavan for a devotional song to sing as they went. He replied that there were plenty of sublime songs composed by the saints, many of them neglected, so there was no need to compose a new one. However, they continued to urge him, and some days later he set out on Padakshini around the hill, taking a pencil and paper with him, and on the way composed the 108 verses. Tears of ecstasy streamed down his face as he wrote, sometimes blinding his eyes and choking his voice. The poem became the great devotional inspiration of the devotees. All the pain of longing and all the bliss of fulfillment are mirrored in its glowing symbolism. The perfection of knowledge is combined with the ecstasy of devotion. And yet this most heartfelt of poems was composed from the standpoint of the devotee, of one who is still seeking. It is also an acrostic, its 108 verses beginning with the successive letters of the Tamil alphabet. Nevertheless, no poem could be more spontaneous. Some devotees asked Sri Bhagavan the interpretation of some of the verses, and he replied, You think it out, and I will too. I didn't think while I was composing it. I just wrote as it came. There is an ancient legend that a party of rishis, or great sages of lore, living with their families in a forest, were practicing karmas, that is, ritualistic and devotional acts and incantations, by which they had attained supernatural powers and hoped eventually to obtain the supreme deliverance. In this, however, they were mistaken. In order to convict them of their error, or convince them, Shiva appeared before them as a mendicant, accompanied by Vishnu in the guise of Mohini, a beautiful lady. All the rishis fell in love with Mohini and their wives with Shiva, with the result that their equanimity was disturbed and their powers began to wane. Seeing this, they decided that Shiva must be an enemy and conjured up serpents and a tiger and elephant that they sent against him. Shiva, however, merely took the serpents for a garland and, slaying the tiger and elephant, used the skin of the former as a loincloth and of the latter as a shawl. The rishis thereupon, recognizing Shiva's great power, bowed down before him and besought him to give them spiritual instruction and guidance. Only then did Shiva explain to them their error, teaching that action cannot bring release from action, that karma is the mechanism, not the cause of creation, and that it is necessary to go beyond karma, beyond action, to contemplation. 
The poet and devotee Marunganar wrote this story in Tamil verse, but when he reached the point where Shiva gives instruction to the rishis, he besought Bhagavan, who was Shiva incarnate, to write it. And thereupon Bhagavan composed the Upadisa Saram, or the instruction in 30 verses, in which, beginning with the devout and disinterest activity, he explains that, beneficent as it is, incantations are more effective. Silent incantations, again, more effective than those uttered aloud, and more effective still, contemplation. Sri Bhagavan translated the 30 verses into Sanskrit, and the Sanskrit version is regarded as a scripture in that it was chanted daily before Sri Bhagavan together with the Vedas, and is now so chanted before his tomb. The doctrine taught by Sri Bhagavan is enunciated the most comprehensively in this poem and in the Uladu Narpadu, or the 40 verses on reality, together with its supplement of a second 40 verses. Many translations have been made of the 40 verses on reality and commentaries written on it. It has a universality and a condensed wisdom that demands commentary. And yet, as Sri Bhagavan remarked in the conversation quoted above, it was not written as a continuous poem, but the verses were composed from time to time as occasion arose. Some of the supplementary 40 were not even composed by Sri Bhagavan himself, but culled from other sources. For when an adequate verse existed elsewhere, he saw no need to write a new one. Nevertheless, the whole is the most complete and profound enunciation of his doctrine. Apart from these two groups, there are a few short poems also. Humor is not lacking among them. One contains instructions for sadhana under the symbolism of a recipe for making papadam, a favorite South Indian savory. The mother of Sri Bhagavan was making it one day and asked him to help, and he thereupon spontaneously wrote the symbolical recipe for her. The poet Avayar once wrote a complaint against the stomach that states, you will not go without food even for one day, nor will you take enough for two days at a time. You have no idea of the trouble I have on your account. O oh, wretched stomach, it is impossible to get on with you. One day there had been feasting at the ashram, and all were more feeling more or less uneasy, and Sri Bhagavan parodied Avayar's stanza and turned it into this. You will not give even an hour's rest to me, your stomach. Day after day, every hour, you keep on eating. You have no idea how I suffer. Oh, trouble-making ego, it is impossible to get on with you.